So now we're going to talk briefly about some of the strengths and weaknesses of the various algorithms. And we've talked about each of these in the lectures on these. So I'm just going to be summarizing these strengths and weaknesses of the algorithms that we've talked about since the midterm. We already talked about the KNN. It can be used for classification and numeric. And for this to be implemented properly, it uses distances. It has to be able to determine for the, for the instance I'm trying to estimate, how far is that away from all of the other instances that are in the data set that might be the nearest neighbors. And so we use a distance calculation. So we use the used to typically use the Euclidean distance. And so I've got examples in this deck for that day and in the readings for that day of how to do that. And so you could be expected to calculate some simple Euclidean distances where I might say which of these potential nearest neighbors is the closest to the instance being estimated. It's non-parametric in the sense that there is no model. It's just that your other instances are going to be evaluated for whether they're close or not close, which are the best neighbors. There's no function mapping or anything like that. It's just how close are the, neighbor, are the potential neighbors to the one you're trying to estimate. One of the strengths and weaknesses of KNN is that every single variable is considered in the calculation of determining whether an instance is a nearest neighbor or not. So the good thing about that is that every single input variable is considered in terms of trying to determine whether any new instance is the nearest neighbor. The bad part about that is that if some of those are noise, if some of those input variables are not good in terms of helping with prediction, then you can confuse KNN because you're giving it noisy or unrelated data and because the method in and of itself has no way to determine which predictors are good and which ones are just noise, then it's kind of blind to that. Now, if you know that a, a given predictor has a strong relationship, so for example, if you were to try to predict a price of a car, and we know empirically that the biggest driver of pricing on a car is how old the car is, we could improve KNN's ability to estimate by putting the value or the price of the car in more than one time. Uh, or in that way, we've sort of like given it extra weight. So we could do that. Uh, we also went through examples in homework where we used a variable reduction technique by using something like logistic regression to determine which input variables had some sort of relationship to the output variable and getting rid of the rest of the variables that didn't have a significant value. And we showed empirically through our homework that KNN does much better. When you give KNN just the variables that really have useful predictor information, then it can do a good job. But when you give it noise, when you give it stuff that doesn't matter, it just confuses KNN. One of the issues with KNN is that we talked about earlier that it's slow. Another is finding the best K. There's no empirical, excuse me, there's no theoretical way to know what is the best K. In other words, what is the right number of neighbors? And so we have to use our tools to actually try a series of number of Ks. We'll try one, two, three, four, and usually on up to 15. Sometimes we'll even try up to 50 to determine what is the best value of K that does the very best job of doing enough fitting, but not overfitting. And so KNN is a process of having to try different values of K to find the best fit. Euclidean distance, so be able to calculate a simple Euclidean distance for an example problem. I won't go through that here in detail, but you can look at the source slide decks for the lectures and readings of that day. and be able to do simple examples of that. Artificial neural networks, you should understand how the networks are made, what the layers are, and that there's an input hidden and an output layer. One of the nice things about AN is that it can map linear and nonlinear relationships and also interactions between input variables. And so AN can do that and do a good job of that. Research has shown that with up to around 12 hidden nodes in the hidden layer, and often with even less than that, an AN network can approximate any continuous function. So it's an amazing learner. In our class, we were often getting very good results with three to five hidden nodes and one or two layers. There has to be a random starting place for the weights on the lines, and so then the algorithm has to learn from a starting spot. So generally speaking, what happens with AND implementations is a random starting place is given for the weights, and then they are 
iterated in terms of improving and strengthening the relationships and those that seem to be the most predictive are given more weight and those that are not really helping with the prediction are giving less weight and and so that's how and does it so we have to do a number of tours a number of different starting spots usually to find a good model the input layer in an AN is where the input columns or the input data actually is. The hidden layer is the intermediate layer and the output layer is the value of the outputs. And so this is what a neural network typically looks like. Sometimes there will be more than one hidden layer. So this is an example of one hidden layer, but there could be two, three, or four, or five different number of hidden layers. Generally in this course we work with just one or two layers. Now the way a node works inside a neural network is there is a transfer function. So at the hidden layer and at the output layer of a neural network there is a transfer function. So all of the values of the inputs are actually brought in, summed together, added to a, a, um, a random sort of like intercept or random what they call a bias then this entire value is then run through a function. Now this function could be a linear function and if so then this is very much like a multiple linear regression. You have like an intercept or a bias and then you have the weights coming in from each of the input variables. Then this is all summed together and then run through a function. If it's a linear function then that's what would happen is that we would have what looks like an MLR. If this is a nonlinear function like a tan h or a logistic response function then we still have to have all of these values summed up and then the sum is given into that function and then an output is the output is given so what would be fed in here for example in the example of logistic response function could be the value of legit and so then this function would be 1 over 1 plus e raised to the negative legit and then what comes out of that is going to be some value between 0 and 1 it has been empirically proven that the logistic response function is usually not the best function for doing a nonlinear model. The tan h is better. The tan h goes from negative 1 up to 1, where legit goes from 0 to 1. So the fact that you can have negative values and positive values as your outcome, that is the a that comes out, is helpful because sometimes you're trying to define something that is a negative or a positive outcome value. And the other thing is that tan h does not tend to get stuck. And in other words, it doesn't train to a certain point and then just get stuck and not be able to train any closer or any better where the logistic response function does tend to get stuck. And this is why a lot of your tools do not put in the logistic response function as a transfer function. Instead, they'll put in tan h or a variety of others. Now, some there are many different transfer functions out there. We worked with a couple of them in this course. But in a lot of the tools, you can d designate different types of transfer functions if you want to. It's usually good to have a combination of linear and nonlinear transfer functions because if a linear fits the data better, then the weights can be given to that. If the nonlinear fits the data better, then more weights can be given to the nonlinear transfer functions. Here's an example of uh, us putting in different values of, uh, of tan, you know, for the tan h function. And so different values for x would go in, and then basically no, then the outcomes are going to be between negative 1 and positive 1.